Hi everyone, I'm Victoria Field, co-host of Metabolic Health Summit, and I'm really excited to be jumping on today to interview a very special guest. Uh, somebody who's been doing incredible work with Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. Now, did you know that nearly 6 million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's? In fact, by 2050, that number is expected to jump to nearly 13 million. So it's highly likely you probably know somebody with Alzheimer's or maybe somebody you love is experiencing some cognitive decline. And it's traditionally thought that when you're dealing with a diagnosis like that, that there is nothing you can do. Like it's a normal part of aging. But my guest today, Dr. Dale Bredesen, says there's something you can do. There's actually a lot you can do. And he says Alzheimer's should be and shall be a rare disease. So really excited to introduce you to him today. So if you came to MHS 2019, you might remember that he spoke about the first survivors of Alzheimer's. You heard that right. Typically you only hear about, you know, maybe cancer survivors and you don't ever hear about somebody surviving Alzheimer's. But Dr. Dale Bredesen has quite a few stories actually. He just published a book recently called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's that's out right now that explores stories of people he's worked with and that have used his program that have gone from early stage Alzheimer's to improvement and even complete reversal. It sounds uh, just out of this world, but it's, it's actually happening. And he has the data, the scans, the information to back it up. And you, you should certainly check this book out. I'm excited to say that we are actually giving a copy away. Uh, Friday, the 17th, September 17th, we'll be announcing the winner to enter to win a copy of this book. And by the way, a ticket to Metabolic Health Summit 2022, where Dr. Dale Bredesen will be speaking again. Make sure you comment, share this video, because that's how you enter to win this book and a ticket to our next conference. And we'll be announcing a winner on Friday, September 17th. So I just want to make sure I'm throwing that out there because I really, really recommend to look into his work if you or someone you know might be dealing with this devastating disease and even not maybe dealing with this because this is something that can be discovered or you can see a shift in the brain happen 20 years prior to a diagnosis. So something that, you know, Dr. Bredesen says, we need to use that time to potentially prevent it from developing into a late stage disease. So before we dive into the interview, I do want to give you a little bit more information about Dr. Bredesen. He's an internationally recognized expert in the mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and a New York Times bestselling author. He has held faculty positions at UCSF, UCLA, and UCSD and directed the program on aging at Burnham Institute before becoming the founding president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. In 2013, he returned to UCLA as the director of the Easton Center for Alzheimer's Disease Research. The Bredesen Laboratory studies basic mechanisms underlying the neurodegenerative process and the translation of this knowledge into effective therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions, leading to the publication of over 220 research papers. He and his group developed a new approach to the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, and this approach led to the discovery of subtypes of Alzheimer's disease, followed by the first description of reversal of symptoms in patients with MCI and Alzheimer's disease with the RECODE protocol. That stands for reversal of cognitive decline, published in 2014, 2016, and 2018. I highly recommend if you've not looked into his work and you or your loved ones might be suffering from this devastating disease to look him up. And uh, I cannot wait to introduce you to him. Hello, Dr. Bredesen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have, uh, I'm so excited about this, this interview for many reasons. And I just, I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. So great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I mean, you have been doing some incredible research over the last 30 years. This is not just <laughs> recent. This has been ongoing for a long time. Um, you've got some great books uh, that I previously mentioned that we'll get into as well. 
uh, diving into some of that work. Honestly, in my opinion, that serve as more than just for Alzheimer's patients, but a blueprint for life, if you will. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into uh, your work today. And you know what's really interesting is sort of you've been exploring it. What's the heart of Alzheimer's? What's at the heart? What it's at its core? And what's sort of traditionally thought of as as Alzheimer's is you know it's got one cause that we really don't know, and it's got one treatment, which you know as you're finding out couldn't be maybe further from the truth. So let's dive into that a little bit and what you found in terms of um, your discovery on the types of Alzheimer's that we've that we've got. And um, yeah, I'm excited to explore that. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so what we found in our 30 years of research, you know, to make a very long story very short, is that what we call Alzheimer's disease is actually an insufficiency. So you have a network in your brain that is uh, neuroplastic. You make, make new memories, you keep new memories, etc. And you have a network that serves that. And interestingly, at the heart of that um, is the amyloid precursor protein, APP, um, that people have focused on one of the peptides from that amyloid beta peptide, understandably, because it collects in the brains of people. But what it turns out, this is a beautiful molecular switch um, very much like uh, the president of your country. So it's like, you know, the president of my brain is stand. So, okay, you've got, you've got this thing in the middle there that's deciding when things are good, when you have enough support, you have enough energetics, you have appropriate metabolism, you don't have insulin resistance, you don't have too much inflammation, so forth and so on. Um, then this actually switches you to a mode of generation and maintenance so you can now make new synapses. So this is literally a synaptoblastic mode. But at the same time, this same molecule, when things are bad, when your hormones and trophic factors are low, when you have too much demand and not enough supply, you switch into a synaptoclastic mode. You literally go from a growth mode to a growth and maintenance mode um, to a protective downsizing mode. And by the way, there's a direct analogy to what happened to all of us with the pandemic. So, you know, in early uh, uh, 2020, we were all told, okay, you got a shelter in place. Um, you've got to socially distance. You may not be able to go to work for a while. You got to really pull back. We all went into this protective downsizing mode. And of course the result was that our country went into a significant recession. And then we had to take steps to, to exit that recession. Very much the same thing with what happens in Alzheimer's. You have a number of insults, you go into this protective downsizing mode. And unfortunately, as long as you are exposed to those, um, you've got ongoing inflammation, you've got ongoing toxicity and so forth and so on, you continue in this protective downsizing mode. And interestingly, the amyloid beta that everyone has vilified in this disease has turned out to be an antimicrobial peptide, and it has some antiviral effects, and it has some antifungal effects. Um, it's got some antibacterial effects, um, and these were shown very nicely by professors uh, Robert Moyer and Rudy Tanzi from Harvard a number of years ago. So you're really changing the mode, and we need, therefore, to look at what are all the things. What it really says is that this, was, this is a network dysfunction. So just as we say, well, if someone's got scurvy, we want to add the vitamin C, if someone has cognitive decline, we want to get in there and determine all the things because it's not a simple deficiency, it's a complex deficiency. So we want to look at all these things. And that leads to a couple of really important implications. One of them is just what you mentioned, that therefore there are these subtypes of Alzheimer's. So there are people that will have more of an inflammatory, what we call type one or inflammatory Alzheimer's more of a glycotoxic where you've got both insulin resistance and you've got, you've got toxicity from the non-enzymatic glycation itself. You also have atrophic types of Alzheimer's, very different than the inflammatory type where you, you don't have a lot of inflammation, but you just can't support the neural network. And it often is because you have sleep apnea uh, or because you have to, you're too low on your trophic factors, hormonal support, nutritional support, et cetera. Then there is really more of a toxic type 
uh, where you, you ha may have biotoxins, you may have inorganic toxins, things like air pollution, which has turned out to be very important for so many of us, or mercury, things like that. Or you may have organic toxins, anything from formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, glyphosate, and on and on. And then there's a more vascular type and a more traumatic type. And of course, many people have features of multiple of these. The other big implication is that I think, and it's something that I think has really hurt uh, all of us as practitioners to trying to help people. And that is, imagine that cancer researchers had told you, well, it's not cancer until it's all over your body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not all over your body yet, come back later. Well, wait a minute, you know, you, the last thing you wanna do is wait that late. So there's a term called mild cognitive impairment or MCI, which is used all the time. And unfortunately, that is a relatively late stage of Alzheimer's disease. So there are basically four stages. The first stage, you're asymptomatic. You don't know that CS, your spinal fluid can already show abnormalities. Your PET scan can already show abnormalities, but you don't feel anything yet. So that's the first stage of Alzheimer's. You could call it pre-Alzheimer's. The second stage is SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. You know there's something wrong. Your spouse may know, your coworkers may know, but you're still testing within the normal range. Now, again, it may be that you were testing off the charts before, and now you're simply into the normal range, and that can be a problem with the testing itself. But this SCI often lasts 10 years. So we have a tremendous opportunity to make it so that Alzheimer's is a rare disease, which is what it should be. The problem is people don't go in at the time. If they do, their doctors say, you're not that bad. You're still testing normally. That's the time to jump on things. That should be called early stage Alzheimer's. Absolutely. Then the third of the four stages, which is called MCI, mild cognitive impairment, really should be called advanced stage Alzheimer's. You've already had this going on typically for more than 10 years. And by the time you finally get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, it's typically about 20 years since the, at the biochemical abnormalities started. So you're really you know, fighting a lots and lots of years of changes in this network. And you've lost many synapses, often lost many neurons, et cetera. So MCI is a late stage of the problem. And that uh, typically lasts a few years their conversion rate is somewhere around 10% per year from MCI to full-on Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is the fourth stage. By definition, you have to be losing activities of daily living. So that's a very, very late stage and probably should be called something like final stage Alzheimer's or something like that. So we really have, as you can see, this tremendous opportunity to get this done with people who are on prevention or early reversal, and we encourage people to do that. Having said that, we do have people, even people in late stages, that we see improvement, but number one, it's the exception, not the rule, and number two, um, it's much harder. So you really have to work with these people to get some improvement. Uh, and so in our trial that we posted just a couple months ago, uh, we had people who were in the MCI, late MCI, and then early Alzheimer's, still a very late stage of the disease. 84% of those people showed cognitive improvement. So even the majority of those people could get better. But often when you have Alzheimer's, you don't get better all the way back to perfect. Whereas in the earlier stages, you can shoot your MOCA scores. We had people going from 19 to 30. Uh, 30 is a perfect score. Uh, we also had improvements in their MRIs. So, you know, people would argue, well, this is all placebo effect. Well, their MRIs don't have a placebo effect. Their MRIs are actually showing improvement in hippocampal volume, improvement in, in gray matter. Uh, and so these are, you know, these are objective improvements in these people. So there are a lot of implications. We really have to think about this disease differently. We have to treat it differently. Um, it is a huge problem. And for perspective, COVID-19 has now killed more than 600,000 Americans. Alzheimer's disease of the currently living Americans will kill about 45 million. So almost a hundred times the size of the COVID-19 pandemic, a, a true pandemic. Wow. Oh my gosh. And it's, it's so great to have people like yourself who are looking at this so differently than what's currently happening and understanding that this is so complex. It's not a one size fits all for, for patients, right? You've got to take each case as it comes individually. And 
Um, that's what I really loved about your second book that you came out with, The End of Alzheimer's Program that I have here. Well, you can't see, it's behind the green screen. But um, this book really, honestly, as I, as I was getting through it, um, as I mentioned, is more of like this blueprint for, honestly, for life. I mean, you cover so many important aspects from everything from nutrition to sleep, to stress relief and meditation, to even to the bed sheets that you have on your, your bed. And I, I really found that it's honestly something that everybody should really take a look at if they want to essentially upregulate their entire life, <laughs> if you will. Um, but in looking at that one uh, area of, you know, one type of Alzheimer's that I found to be really fascinating, because I think people really don't think about it is um, this the toxic Alzheimer's um, subtype, because detoxification, I know, from at least from reading your work, that that is one of the most hardest things to sort of tackle. And people don't think about, you know, what they're putting on their skin, or what they're breathing, even in their house, or the water that they're using. This is something that's not really talked about very much at all. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that component and how, uh, why maybe it is so tough to kind of reverse that subtype. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, what we found, we, we first were doing this back and published the first paper back in 2014 on reversal of cognitive decline. We noticed that there was this group of patients that didn't respond that had something different than we understood at that time. And as we started to dig into this deeper and look at what's their histories, what, what's happened to them, we found that these were people that just as you said, had toxic exposures. And as I mentioned earlier, some of them had biotoxins um, and this is relatively common. People who are exposed to things like mycotoxins, trichothecenes, opratoxin A, gliotoxin, things like that. Some of them had inorganics, various things like mercury and exposure to air pollution and things like that. And then some of them had organics, things like glyphosate and toluene and benzene, things like that. And you know, you go back to the people who were the first responders at 911, uh, actually about 15% of them developed cognitive decline within 15 years, even the ones that were relatively young. So it really shows you this toxin exposure is a huge issue over time, and it really does sneak up on you, unfortunately. So we'll have, for example, people who are living in uh, very moldy homes with mold exposure, which again, as a, as a neurologist, when I was training, we were never taught that mycotoxins had anything to do with Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline of any kind. Um, and yet it's emerging as one of the more common problems and you really have to identify it. You've got to quantitate it. You've got to detoxify, just as you mentioned. And we see people improving as they, as they detoxify. And the problem is they're sitting there and they're essentially, they're, they're getting more and more toxin exposure from all the different things that we, you know, that we uh, live with. You know, unfortunately we are all living um, in an Alzheimer's soup, in a Bouya Bess, um, that's got all these things. And this has really emerged as a big problem for Parkinson's, by the way, which yeah. is commonly a toxin-related illness. Uh, and so, you know, we have these various exposures and slowly we're, we're dealing with them. We're doing everything from detoxifying them, excreting them from various ways uh, to, you know, putting them in our organs, literally. So you've got a situation where we see many people right around the time of menopause, who will now, as they are changing from more osteoblastic to osteoclastic, as they say, this osteoclastic burst that you have for about seven years around the time of menopause, one of the things you're doing is dumping these things that you've sequestered in your bones back into your system. And of course, you're also changing things like your progesterone levels and progesterone is a critical part of detox. So multiple reasons here, you're now at increased risk for toxin related illnesses. And we very frequently see this, what we call type three or toxic Alzheimer's disease. And these people often look different. They often have more of a non-amnestic presentation. So they'll often have more of a problem with executive function, problems with planning things, problems with calculations, problems with facial recognition, problems with word finding, um, spatial orientation. It's often more of a biparietal disease than a bitemporal disease, which focuses more uh, on, the, on the amnestic part. Now, they, some of the people do have the amnestic part as well, and ultimately they have all of those 
but more of the presentation uh, really keys you. And if you see someone, I mean, it's more, unfortunately, more, it's more common in women as Alzheimer's disease as a whole is, as Maria Shriver has told all of us, you know, this is a woman centric disease, 65% of patients, 60% of caregivers. So when you see someone who's a 52 year old woman, who's had some depression recently is, you know, either in perimenopause or menopause uh, or just postmenopausal, um, and now is presenting with some problems with planning, often unfortunately lose her job at the time because no longer can plan, no longer can do those executive functions. Um, that is very high suspicion for type three and critical to look at whether this person uh, has exposure to toxins as part of, or some of the contributors to the cognitive decline. And then you need to get in there and really get an optimal detox that it involves everything from the GI to, you know, to urination and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and filtered water uh, to uh, appropriate uh, saunas and all these things. And, you know, it's interesting when I was training, this was way back in the 1980s, uh, we never saw people come in in their 50s with Alzheimer's disease, um, 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe late 60s. Um, this was simply not a disease of people of that age. Uh, now it's one of the most common things we see is people presenting in their 50s. And the other thing that's important to point out is we saw this as a disease of older people. Mm -hmm. We now know that it starts typically 20 years before a diagnosis. So what we thought of as a disease of 60s, 70s, 80s, it's really a disease of your 40s, 50s, and 60s, and even into your 30s. Um, as your as your chain, your insulin, you're, you know, you're developing that insulin resistance, even when you're very young. And of course, children have insulin resistance sometimes. Yeah. So they're really, unfortunately, putting themselves at risk for hypertension, we see diagnosed, again, another important risk factor, metabolic syndrome, another important risk factor, change in the, the gut microbiome, another important risk factor, sleep apnea, uh, problems with uh, with dentition and change in oral microbiome and sinus microbiome. You know, these things are all ongoing. And unfortunately, the way the standard of care, you, you mentioning standard of care earlier, absolutely, this is critical because doctors simply say, well, you know, this is not something that we're going to deal with today. It's something we can deal with down the road, or they don't even bother to look at this. When you go in today for an evaluation for Alzheimer's, people don't typically check oximetry. They're not looking at your oral microbiome. They're not looking at your gut microbiome. They're not looking at your methylation. You're not looking at your toxins. And, and this is the problem. And so no surprise, the doctor comes back and says, it's Alzheimer's, we don't know why you get it. Well, in fact, we have a lot of information about you get it, but you have to look for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's you bringing up how this can happen. You know, you can see a shift in the brain 20 years prior to a diagnosis. Just think about how much lost time that we could have sort of improving yeah. cognition and thankfully, you know, brain health and, and just improving our overall mental health is becoming a bigger topic of conversation. But um, what you've sort of outlined, and I love how in this um, most recent book that you put out on the first survivors of Alzheimer's that you include a section for people who just want to improve their cognitive performance and whatnot in the back of the book as well. Um, but, you know, and I would like to get into some of the specific stories that were just mind blowing uh, in this in this book. But speaking to sort of, you know, the amyloid and removing the amyloid as being this like hyper focus right now of sort of the larger community um, and, and removing it is great. I know you've said that in your presentation at, at you know, MHS 2019 when you joined us then you kind of dove into that. But removing it without addressing sort of maybe right. healing some of these underlying causes, that's where maybe that disconnect is. Can you talk about for people who are interested in, in maybe just improving their cognition or maybe they feel like, hey, I might be dealing with something, you know, related to cognitive decline here. How can we heal? What, what are, I know you briefly mentioned them, but what are the key things that you would tell somebody? Yeah, it's a great point. And actually, you know, I wrote about this in the new, in the new book the first survivors of Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. seven people actually wrote their amazing stories about how they were told there was nothing that could be done. They had Alzheimer's, et cetera, often with family members affected, really, really uh, horrible. And as you right. mentioned, the amyloid is part of this, but we have to recognize its place. It's not the whole answer. This, uh, this overly simplified idea of, oh, this is just a disease of amyloid. We remove the amyloid, everyone's gonna be better. 
That's been shown very clearly with multiple clinical trials, hundreds of millions, even into the billions of dollars to do these trials. It simply hasn't shown that that's the problem. People don't get better. At the, the claim has been that some of them may not get worse as quickly. So you go from like this to, to like this. You don't actually get better. And so we often show a slide to just show that in the, in the trial we did, you actually see people get better. In the trial with, the, with Aduhelm, which is the one that was approved on June 7th by the FDA, very controversial. What happens is you get worse slightly slower. That was at one dose in one trial. Other doses and the other trial, no improvement at all. And in fact, in one trial, it was worse than placebo. Oh, wow. So yeah, the problem is, as you mentioned, again, think about it. Getting rid of amyloid is like getting rid of your police force. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't help. And I should have mentioned you know, earlier when I was talking about MCI, calling someone mild cognitive impairment, which is where these people were when they got treated with the Aduhelm, is like saying that someone has mildly metastatic cancer. Um, it's a late stage of the problem. And we really want to deal with it, hopefully before that. But if you're going to remove the amyloid, as you mentioned, please remove the reasons that it's there. Identify it. I do think there's going ultimately going to be a role for reducing amyloid with probably lower doses, because when you go in there quickly, you get micro hemorrhages, you get brain swelling. There was brain swelling in 40% of the people who took the Adohelm. Um, there were micro hemorrhages in 17% of these people. I mean, this has all sorts of side effects. And of course it costs about $100,000 per year, 56,000 just for the drug, okay. but then all the infusions and all the scans you need and all that, um, it's around $100,000 per year. So this is a huge issue. This is why three of, you know, all of the people on the, the 11 member expert panel recommended against approving it. 10 of them have said absolutely not. One of them said he didn't know. Nobody recommended improvement so that when it was approved, and it was again approved for a complete misunderstanding, it was approved with the idea that we don't see improvement in cognition. So that's what was stated. We're going to do it on a special uh, accelerated approval. So what they're saying is we don't see evidence for cognitive improvement. Yes, exactly. That's the point. But we do see evidence for removal of amyloid, and we think that that will be helpful. Well, wait a minute, that's exactly what the, all these trials have proved wrong, that when you remove the, it's always completely, completely backwards. You know, uh, so the, the, again, the reasoning was actually completely backwards. And this is why so many people have been up in arms about this particular approval. It's now, as you know, um, a, in congressional uh, investigation onto why this was approved when all of the data were against approval and the entire expert panel recommended against approval. Right, yeah, it's, it's really uh, fascinating that, I, I mean, I can't imagine being in your shoes and just the years and years of work you've put into this and here is sort of this non-toxic, uh, you know, approach that includes essentially like if your spouse went on it, you have Alzheimer's, your spouse is gonna improve as well, even if they weren't suffering from, you know, cognitive decline. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's sort of a, a why not? You've, you've provided this incredible evidence. I mean, as I was going through, literally, I, had, I think I had goosebumps the entirety of this book, <laughs> reading these stories. I, it, you don't hear about this, you know, here, uh, I love the, the saying that you say, you, you know, you, you might know a cancer survivor, but yeah. you probably don't know an Alzheimer's survivor honestly, until now. I mean, this, you can see all my little tabs of all the times I was like this. It, it was really an incredible, incredible book to read. And I, I, I kind of want to dive into those experiences because I think that really says a lot. Obviously, in some of your previous books, you talk about um, sort of the program and the protocol, but this is like direct from the horse's mouth. I mean, you're, you're really like getting a firsthand experience. And one of the, uh, I would say the people that sort of struck me the most was uh, Julie, and, um, you know, just in terms of how she suffered from a variety of insults starting in her early thirties. And right. that really hit home to me. I'm in my thirties and you don't think about it much like what you were saying, how, how early this can start. And you don't really think about it being in your thirties, but there is something that we can do. And Julie really kind of took it upon herself to continue to kind of push forward. 
And I know she brought up the ketogenic diet and I'm so glad she did to you, which is amazing. And um, then went on to start this whole community of APO for, um, you know, people who are at high risk for Alzheimer's where they can share information. Um, so that was one that really kind of hit home for me. But what has been sort of the most profound thing for you in working with, I think 5,000 people have now, now gone through your recode program plus probably at this point, what's yeah. been the most profound um, situation that you've seen where, you know, from cognitive assessment to MRIs to you name it. Yeah. So first, let me just address a point you made things that happen during when, when you are young do impact, look at all the research on ACEs that yeah. have happened over the last you know, decade or so, especially right. people looking more and more and saying, hey, these things that happened during your childhood have big influences on what happens as an adult. And we're seeing, right. and, and, and just as you know, Dr. Robert Lustig has taught all of us and with his recent book, Metabolical, how critical it is. And look at all the people, as he's pointed out, he was a pediatrician. He is a pediatrician. And looking at people who are having even insulin resistance, obesity, uh, you know, changes in body fat composition, metabolic syndrome, huge issues, even heart disease yeah. when they are children. And so these things all impact, you know, hypertension, these things all impact us later. And so for many of us, we may not develop these as children, but we may develop them in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And these all impact, and this has been shown by the epidemiologists repeatedly. But to come back to your point about, you know, what is the most profound you know, just hearing the, the change in people's lives and their, and their loved ones. So one of the stories there was from Deborah, mm -hmm. a brilliant attorney, went to Harvard, uh, you know, amazing. Her father was, had died of Alzheimer's and was a neurologist, a, a very well-respected neurologist. Her grandmother had died of Alzheimer's and she then began to show the same symptoms. Uh, went in to get evaluated and they told her, yeah, you know, you're, you're not testing particularly well. She was really in the, you know, SCI to MCI border where things were not right for her, yeah. uh, but she wasn't too far along. And she did beautifully, went back and they retested and said, oh my gosh, you know, what have you been doing? You're really testing beautifully now. She, of course, was concerned about her children. Yeah. And when uh, we've had others, as I mentioned in the about the trial, who went from MOCA scores of 19. I mean, this is now border, this is really just crossing over from MCI to full on Alzheimer's that came back to 30. These yeah. people are per scoring per perfectly. Now they know they're not, they're not perfect the way they were at their best quite yet, but we have many people who say, wow, I'm better than I was before I started this because I'm now optimizing all these things. Yeah. You know, this is just like the rest of health. You've got to optimize to make your brain function well, good processing speed, synaptoblastic, you know, able to make and keep memories, all the things that you're trying to do. You've got to optimize this entire network. That's not a big surprise. And I do think it's a bit of a surprise that we neuroscientists have thought that if we're, you know, we're just going to see one thing. Uh, misfolded protein, that's a common one. Okay, we're gonna now wipe out the misfolded proteins and everything's gonna be fine. And that simply hasn't sh been shown to be the case. This is a complex system and it needs to be dealt with in a systems biology fashion where you're now optimizing this set of things. But when we do that, we see such exciting improvements again and again and again. Um, and I've had, uh, I've had some emails from people who said, oh, my wife started to speak again. These are people who are very late stage. Now, she didn't come back to perfectly normal, but she was speaking again. She was dressing herself again. She was interacting with people again. One of the most common things I hear is they're so much more engaged. Before, they would kind of be staring off into the distance, but now they're really engaged with the family. They're doing things, you know, they're driving well. They're doing all the things that you need to do. So there are, you know, repeatedly, just uh, you know, amazing, amazing stories. And you, I'm sure you read the story of Sally, who's one of the seven in the book who wrote her stories. And she couldn't even remember to pick up her grandchildren from school, was really worried that she's just you know, shirking her duties uh, you know, involuntarily. She simply couldn't remember these things. And she's come back to doing great. Now she actually had an amyloid PET scan to show that she was in early stages of Alzheimer's. She had a MOCA score of 24, which has now come back to perfect 30. Um, she had all sorts of mycotoxins. We've detoxified those for her. 
Uh, and she's done very well. I just talked to her a couple of days ago. She's doing absolutely great. She's now five years. Let's say if there's a single thing that I'm most enthusiastic about, it's the fact that these people sustain their improvements. It's, as I mentioned, it's so great to hear about the families. Julie, as you said, wrote about the fact that her son cried, big six foot son crying when she's telling him I've got Alzheimer's disease. And now she was at his wedding. She's doing great. They have all sorts of interactions. Uh, and she's now over nine years uh, on the protocol. Uh, and so, and patient zero, uh, Kristen, who wrote about her story as well, is also coming up on nine and a half years on the protocol and doing very well. So again, when, you, when you're changing that synaptoblastic to synaptoclastic ratio, and you're now getting on the right side of that, you're healing, you're doing well. Uh, one, I should add one more thing, which is uh, you probably know Dr. Heather Sanderson down in San Diego, who uh, started Marama. And actually we have a Facebook Live uh, with her just recently. Uh, and so she started something called Marama, which is the first assisted living facility that uses this protocol. And what she's seeing is that people where before you go into assisted living and it's nothing but down, down, down. It's just a question of, you know, how long are you going to be going downhill before you pass away? Um, now she's seeing everybody either stay the same or get better. And the, the whole idea of people going into an assisted living facility and then coming back out again because you're better, that's something entirely new to the whole assisted living world. And so very excited that, that Heather has done this uh, and really started a new field of assisted living where you're actually trying to get people better instead of just attending them as they go downhill. Right. And feeling like there's nothing you can do. I mean, talk about empowerment to the patient yeah. and the family and offering such a massive sense of hope. Um, I, I mean, that's the best and biggest word that comes to my mind with this. It's just reading these stories. It almost sounds just too good to be true, but you have hard data to back it up. You've got scans, you've got blood work, you've, you're, you know, cognitive tests, improvements, um, increases in gray matter. I mean, there, there's, just, it's right there. And yeah. so why not, you know, tr follow this path? Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I thought that was such an important point you made. So you're right. People read the stories and they say, it's too good to be true. And yet we're getting data after data, publishing <laughs> data. People tell their stories, testimonials, you know, on and on and on. MRIs, blood work. We just have another paper that's just been submitted showing that even when you scale this to large groups, you see improvement. Although it's wow. interesting. When you have people you're really working one-on-one -on -one basis, they improve more. When you try to scale this to many, many physicians who aren't always as well-trained, they don't do as well. And so we, you know, this is, uh, as I've said many times, it's a bit like surgery. There are people who are really good at it and there are people who aren't getting as good results. So I think it's important. We do have people who say, well, hey, um, I'm reading all these great results. I tried this, it didn't help me. Okay, so it is hard hard for some people. You do have to do a whole set of things. And for some people, they won't find, they won't identify, or the doctor won't identify the things that are actually driving the decline. Yeah. So we see people who, uh, I often will ask them, well, okay, um, you're, you're, are you measuring your ketones and what's your level? Because that is part of the overall energetics. And they'll say, well, I'm not doing that part. Well, okay, then why are you surprised you're not getting better? You know, you have to change. This is a complex system, you are changing it. You have to address the pathogens. You have to get rid of that ongoing inflammation. You have to support the energetics, incredibly important. Um, I think, you know, as we're doing this, we're also seeing it evolve. We're seeing when, oh, wait a minute, it may seem to be better if we include resolvents because you need to resolve that ongoing inflammation. It may work better if we include creatine, for example, to give you a better burst, more mitochondrial support. Some people may do better with stem cells and that the whole area of stem cells, of course, is evolving. It's a very exciting area. But the problem I have, the concern I have is people are trying to do that as a monotherapy. And it's a little bit like trying to, to uh, reconstruct a house, to rebuild a house as it's burning down. Right. Let's get rid of the fire first. Right. Let's, let, let's put out the fire. And then you want to rebuild with all these different things. Yeah. So it is true. People get very upset and they'll say, hey, my spouse went on your program and she didn't get better. Okay. When I, when I get look into it, I typically find, yeah, they didn't address 
these things. This is a, you know, in the best case scenario, we're getting people with dramatic improvements, but that is not yet every case scenario. I wish it were. We're trying to get, okay, what if we get in earlier? What if we do more things? You know, how do we get, how do we get people? Can we make it simpler? Because, you know, I admit the, just as Anthony Fauci said to us all a year and a half ago, uh, the virus is driving the disease. It's telling us what we have to do. We just can't make up stuff. We have to adhere to what the virus is telling us. This is very much the story with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is, is controlling this. We have to deal with this. Now, the good news is we're kind of, you know, we're playing chess with the devil, the Alzheimer's devil. The good news is all the research tells us the moves that the devil makes. So we kind of know how it hurts you. And we can now, we can anticipate these, we can do the right things to get the best outcomes. But uh, it doesn't mean that 100% of people get better. In our trial, 84% of people got better. Well, another point though that was interesting is the few that didn't get better, you could see when you looked into their stories why they didn't get better. As an example, there was one woman who had very high mycotoxin levels, lived in a house that had not only biotoxins, but also chemotoxins. Oh, she wow. said, I don't wanna move out. I don't wanna get away from these and I don't wanna remediate. So no surprise, she did not improve. So the good news is we can kind of see who's gonna improve. We can often see who's not going to improve. And so we really can and should all make this an optional disease. If we all get on appropriate early prevention or early reversal, and we recommend that everybody 45 years or older get a cognoscopy. Just as we all know, when you turn 50, please get a colonoscopy. When you hit 45 or if you're older than 45, please get a cognoscopy. It's pretty easy to do. It's a lot more pleasant than a colonoscopy, I have to say. Uh, and so, you know, get a series of blood tests, an online cognitive assessment. And if you have symptoms, you want to include an MRI with volumetrics. But if you don't have symptoms, you're just there for prevention. You don't necessarily need the MRI. That's optional. So it, we really could make this a rare disease. It's, it's really now becoming optional. And we hope we'll now be able to adapt this to the unique chemistry of ALS, frontotemporal dementia. We're already seeing good results with Lewy body disease. Um, we've started something called the ARC project that looks at two by two by two, just a few people with each. Um, so we're looking at now at people with macular degeneration because it's another area of great need. There's not a good therapy for dry. When you get to wet macular degeneration, again, that's waiting to a very late stage. Better to get something for earlier stages. So the hope is that we'll be able to adapt this sort of approach to all of the major neurodegenerative diseases. Absolutely. And where would somebody, you know, who... I think one of the biggest barriers too is people are kind of um, sometimes when they're experiencing cognitive decline, or maybe they think like, oh, I'm just maybe just a little forgetful. Everybody forgets, or maybe they're embarrassed. I mean, what would you tell that person who is in their 40s, 50s, 60s, kind of starting to notice some things, doesn't really know where to turn in getting that cognoscent? Like, how, what's that next step? What does that look like? Because unfortunately, as you've mentioned, maybe not every uh, neurologist is on the same page here. And um, what resources would you tell them to find somebody who can help them with that? That cognoscent could be that sort of first. Yeah, that's a really good point. And so again, I would encourage people 45 or over, please get on prevention. But for those who haven't done that and are beginning to notice changes, and again, this is one of the biggest problems. People keep trying to uh, you know, keep trying to deny it and say, well, I'm not that bad. Well, you know, my spouse is no better. We hear this all the time. My spouse has problems too. Okay, then you both need to get evaluated. <laughs> no. It doesn't mean that neither needs to get evaluated. It means that both of you. Right. <laughs> and we had uh, one guy from, uh, that, from Los Angeles who came uh, when I was first at UCLA uh, and brilliant, brilliant internist uh, was, was clearly having problems. And his wife said to him, oh, it's, you know, it's just, you know, you, this is just, uh, you know, you're getting a little older. We all have similar problems. Well, this guy then turned out to have a positive amyloid scan, highly positive, wow. APOE4 positive. So he had the genetic risk factors, you know, abnormal MRI, hippocampal atrophy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a FDG PET that was abnormal. Um, he was in relatively late stage MCI already, having struggling at work, all these things. And he responded beautifully. His MRI showed improvements as well uh, and has done very, very well. 
So again, please don't just, you know, please don't just assume that, yeah, when you're, he was in his, in his uh, mid sixties, um, but people, no question, as you indicated, people who are in their thirties and forties will say, you know, it's, things aren't quite right. And the doctors always try to just, uh, you know, they, they try to tell you, don't worry about it. That's the opposite. Look, if you go in and they don't find that things are horrible, look, you're still having, you know, you're having problems. So there are things to optimize. Right. You, again, nobody should get this problem. There are sharp people at a, at a hundred, of course. So yes, um, you, you want to get in early. The worst that can happen if you go in early is they say, you know what, it, it wasn't Alzheimer's and we can now improve the memory you do have anyway. Right. If you That's wait, you're, if you're hoping that they'll say, well, it's not Alzheimer's, well, you still have to make it better, whatever, something is affecting your cognition. But unfortunately, when you wait, it's later and later when they do tell you, yeah, you know, you do have some amyloid, this looks like early Alzheimer's, and you know, there's nothing we can do. Uh, we can give you a medication, but it's really not going to help you very much. Uh, and it has some side effects. So this idea of just wait, because there's nothing you can do, that is really 20th century thinking. And it's actually becoming dangerous thinking. It's really becoming negligence. Now that we have multiple published papers, it's very clear that there's something to be done, especially early on. Then the focus should be getting people as early as possible, not telling people, don't worry about it. Absolutely. And trying to get past that hump of maybe embarrassment, shame, or just denial right. is like that first step. But just, I think, shifting your mindset from like, well, I can't do anything anyway, to I can actually be proactive. And it's things like sleep. It's things like what I, you know, pull out of the fridge. It's, I mean, these are things that impact us every day that I think can be really powerful that reading your work, I think will continue to encourage more people um, to take that next step before it's too late. Because gosh, I, once you, once you experience, you know, I mentioned to you briefly, I, I've been dealing with um long hauler syndrome with yeah. from COVID. And I know you just were thankfully recovered you and your wife as well. I'm so glad you're through that. But honestly, it was like, this is the first taste of, you know, cognitive issues where I've last five to 10 years. I mean, this is my life and improving my metabolic health optimization. And it was like, it's amazing how something like a virus or some other external you know, toxins or what have you can really throw things for a loop. And it was uh, really the first time where I experienced like, Oh goodness. Like I need to up my game even more. And I'm so glad you put it all in a book, how to continue to do that. So, um, so thank you for that. But it's been, I think it's this whole pandemic has especially drawn attention to what yeah. we can all do in this situation. Right. No question. And let me just mention that, you know, that for anyone who's had COVID, including myself, including you, um, you know, we should all be on prevention because this does, this is one of the risk factors. And what happens is, People will often say, well, I'll just try to change this one thing or that one thing. Please, often you'll unearth things that you didn't know about. We had one woman who came in who, was, uh, who said, you know, I think, I think I'm here for prevention, but it's in my family, let's check it out. She had a MOCA score of 23. She was already well into MCI. It sneaks up on you. And so she oh, now is a 30 doing great. Uh, so it's good that she came in when she did. We had another one who was a TV reporter who said, well, I want to do this just as part of my report. Well, she found out during this, oh my gosh, you know, I actually am at high risk. I actually am having some minor issues. So now she's been on the program for about a year, doing very well, um, improving her everything from her lipid status. You know, many of the people who will do this sort of program come off their statins, you know, come off any anti-diabetes drugs that they have to be on for type two diabetes. Uh, and so in any anti-hypertensives, all these things, I'd be mean, very, very helpful to them. So yeah, you know, again, don't wait, find out early. There is so much that can be done. Things do sneak up on you. You don't realize the toxins that you have accreted over the years and accrued over the years that you're dealing with. You yeah. don't realize that your vasculature is not what you thought it was. You don't realize that your sleep is not what you thought it was. And I have a chapter in the new book on wearables because yeah. there's no question wearables are helping all of us. We are finding out where's our heart rate variability. When I developed Delta variant, mm -hmm. my Apple watch showed that in fact, my VO2 max was going down, down, down. This really did affect my heart. It really, unfortunately really did affect me. Now, as I've gotten over this and it's taken over a month, 
Now I'm seeing it coming back and it's almost back to where it started. So I'm very happy about that, that it, it's not stayed down, but it's almost back to where I started. And so these wearables tell us about our sleep. You can do things, obviously you can check your ketones. There's so much you can do these days. And, and you know, things like just check my, my uh, oxygenation status as I slept last night. Yeah, I got a little low. Yeah, <laughs> well, pulse ox. There you go. Oh, cool. There's so much you can do now. And of course, continuous glucose monitoring, I think one of the most important because people will be shocked. Oh my gosh, I'm getting hyperglycemic when I eat health foods mm -hmm. and then I'm plummeting when I sleep. We've got people dropping into their 40s. Both of those bad for your brain. Wow. You're hurting your insulin resistance. And then of course, with hypoglycemia, you're hurting your brain. Um, in a week, so there's so many things now that we can check that can be so helpful for us and help us to get ahead of these complex chronic illnesses. Absolutely. Yeah. I have, you know, my little aura ring yeah, right here and ring. my HRV. I mean, you can see, I, I could tell obviously when I was getting COVID, but you can see in the data <laughs> what was happening to my sleep yes. quality, HRV, all of those things. And uh, it's, it's actually fascinating. And I will say it's very motivating to be able to track those things. And if you know, you're somebody who maybe hasn't done that already, that could be a great way to, to get started and get excited about a new lifestyle change is following all this information. I'm sure you've seen that with patients where they've just, you know, being able to see, a, you know, on a CGM, what actually is happening or their O2 set drop overnight that maybe they didn't know before could be really motivating to kind of start that change. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, Absolutely. it's uh, exciting to see kind of where this is headed. And I know you talk about a variety of different different things that we can do. Obviously there's, you know, there's the toxin component, there's yeah. inflammation, there's vascular, there's so many things. And I know you talk about energetics and where does your sort of, in terms of priorities, nutrition. So say somebody, you know, got through some of your books or read your work and wanted to start with maybe one thing at a time, kind of like, I think it was Julie, where she takes one supplement at a time while she's cycling. Where would you say would be a good place to start? Would that be nutrition and maybe something like your KetoFlex 12-3 plan? Yeah, this is a great point. And so if you, again, if you boil it down chemically, so we actually have a, an equation. So you boil this down chemically, there are four groups of things, two that are against you and two that are for you that when they're too low, it hurts you. So number one, inflammation, anything, these various pathogens, you know, this is chronic inflammation. Number two is these various toxins, as we talked about. Number three is energetics. You need to have enough. You need to have the blood flow. You need to have the oxygenation. You need to have the mitochondrial function, the ketones to burn, all these things. And then number four is trophic activity. You need to have enough NGF and BDNF. You need to have enough estradiol, testosterone, all the various hormones, thyroid, DHEA, et cetera. And then you need to have enough nutrition, including things like vitamin D. Many parallels um, between, by the way, between poor outcomes and COVID, things like low vitamin D and hypertension and obesity and all these are also risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. So you're right. You want to start with the nutrition. Uh, now, again, it's important to note that different people are different. Some people have a different rate limiting step. Some people it is going to be, they've got a lot of toxins on board. Some people it is that their vasculature has been affected. Some people it is the sleep apnea or the change in the oral microbiome. But in general, nutrition affects all of those four. The big four are all affected. It's going to affect your inflammation. It's going to affect your immune system. To some extent, you know, when you're talking about Alzheimer's, you know, conceptually, we're talking about a scenario that again, has a parallel with the pandemic. So what happens in the pandemic? You have your innate system fired up, your adaptive system hasn't kept up. The virus is still there. You haven't been able to clear the virus. And in fact, it's interesting. The virus has a molecular mechanism that prevents your interferons, prevents you from responding. So it literally sneaks up on you because it prevents you from responding until it's this massive, massive amount of virus. And suddenly your system blinks on and says, oh my God, it's late stages already. And so you die by cytokine storm. And of course, this is where dexamethasone, even though it's preventing you from doing some of the things that you need to clear the virus, it's life-saving because you've got too much. You've got cytokine storm. Now in Alzheimer's, same thing. But in now in Alzheimer's, it's cytokine drizzle. 
instead of cytokine storm. <laughs> Over the years, you have this drizzle of cytokines. You've got this ongoing innate immune system. And again, your adaptive system is not up to snuff. So part of the treatment is let's get the innate system down here. Let's get the adaptive system up here. Let's clear the pathogens. Let's clear the problems here. Let's heal the gut. Let's get your microbiome in good shape, your oral microbiome, as well as your gut microbiome, your sinus microbiome, all these things. So as you indicated, Nutrition is the place to start. And again, you know, we're agnostic and I'm not a nutritionist. I'm going as, as a neuroscientist saying, what does it take to make and keep synapses? And guess what? It takes the sort of nutrition that you've been talking about and others have been talking about for years. So number one, you need to have to be able to get something to burn. So you need to get people into, to, into ketosis. Now you have to be careful. If you just suddenly go into a fasting state and you have a BMI of 18, you can hurt yourself. You can drive yourself. You can actually have more cognitive decline because this is again, fundamentally a disease of insufficiency. But the surprise is, and the paradox is, it is a disease of insufficiency born in many people of excess too many simple carbs, too much insulin resistance, too much processed food, all those. So we're having to reverse that. We got to get you some, some ketones, which is why we suggest just take exogenous ketones at the beginning. You can get into endogenous ketosis later. You don't want to lose that energy. When you're getting cognitive decline, you have the worst of both worlds. You don't have the glucose to burn in your brain because you're insulin resistant. And the PET scans show that. You have reduction of, in, of, of of a glucose utilization, temporal parietal lobe, that's the classic. But you're also not able to make and use ketones. So you've got the worst of both worlds and you really have, a, you really have an, a, a, an energetic emergency in your central nervous system. So we need to make you insulin sensitive and that's where the diet comes in. So we use a mildly ketogenic, plant rich, that helps with your detox, that helps with phytonutrients, that helps with your gut microbiome, I mean, on and on and on. Of course, you want to include some probiotics and prebiotics. Of course, you want to check gut microbiome, et cetera. So we call this KetoFlex 12-3. And we're, again, we're agnostic. If it turns out that eating steak 24 seven actually helps your brain more someday, well, then we'll look at that. Right we're now, the, same way. <laughs> the, best, the best articles published show that a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet gives you the best outcomes for preventing and reversing cognitive decline. And we call it KetoFlex 12-3 because it is flexitarian and because a minimum of 12 hours at night, you got to have that autophagy. you got to have, you got to get those glymphatics fired up. You've got to be able to cleanse the brain. And then you want to have, make sure that you're not high on your insulin while you're going in. And so again, we want to look at your HOMA IR. Uh, so many of these people, you know, one of the guys who was here for, who was a reporter, actually, and again, a guy said, well, I want to do this for myself. He said, well, wait a minute, you know, my HOMA IR, you're telling me is over two, and you're telling me that's bad. But, you know, I don't feel that bad. No, but this is telling you, you're on a bad path here, because you have got insulin resistance, and that does not bode well for your future. So good, it's good that you're fixing this now, because it's going to help you in many ways. So yes, nutrition is the most important way to start because it impacts all of these different factors. It's improving your energetics. It's improving your inflammation. It's improving your immune system. It's reducing your cytokine drizzle. It's improving your ability to make appropriate hormones. It's getting your, your appropriate nutrients. Um, you know, it's indirectly improving your trophic uh, factor support. You're getting into to better ketosis. Um, and, and it's even helping you detox. So it impacts the four big areas that are actually driving the cognitive decline. And again, the, the idea that when you have a, a previously untreatable disease and to treat it, you would uh, go after the things that are actually causing it, that seems so obvious. You know, why don't, why is, you know, why haven't we all been doing that? But unfortunately, the current standard of care in Alzheimer's is not to determine and go after the very things that are driving. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that brings me to a, an interesting point that you kind of brought up at the end of your most recent book, which is we're in the thick of a medical revolution. 
And uh, it's a really exciting time. It's also, I'm sure, a very challenging time for people such as yourself. And we're trying to elevate the science on the metabolic therapies, you know, that the research that's happening on metabolic therapies and health and, you know, programs like Recode and what you're doing. But we're in this sort of really interesting place. What has to happen in order for us to see some, some change and to see the way we treat diseases, especially like Alzheimer's, um, and, and to make it that rare disease like you talk about so much? Yeah, great point. Um, so it's interesting. I was talking to the vice chancellor of one of the major medical schools in the United States. Remember when the first book came out back in 2017? Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, and he's known for being a tremendous educator. And he said, you know, we'd like to teach our medical students this new medicine, but we can't do it until all doctors accept it. Well, and of course, all doctors won't accept that until you teach it. So we're stuck in this kind of silly, uh, you know, vicious, uh, uh, vicious circle. And so, you know, the reality is, I think having publishing trials to show that, yes, this really does work better. I think that's an important next step. And so I think all of us need to think about how do we publish our data? How do we show that, yes, this really does work better than standard of care? Uh, we, we're unfortunately stuck in this situation where the, you know, the, the healthcare companies are making money doing it the old fashioned way. The pharmaceutical companies are making money doing it the old fashioned way. So not, not only is there a lack of incentive, there is a tremendous disincentive for these groups that are controlling healthcare to make changes. And so we need to get change. And some of this is going to be by having patients go back and demand change. Some of this is going to be by publishing trials. And we've uh, posted, as I mentioned, one recently. Um, and we're now, uh, we have you know, unprecedented results from that. We're now planning the next one, which will be a uh, which will be a randomized controlled trial. I mean, I was surprised when we did the last proof of concept trial, the IRB would not even allow us to include a control, which seems ridiculous. And of course, we got hammered for that. Uh, why didn't you include a control? Well, we weren't allowed to. We were allowed to take the next step. The good news is there are very good historical controls. We know what happens to people with MCI and Alzheimer's. There are over 150,000 papers published on Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of historical control. We know what happens to MRIs over time. We know how quickly atrophy happens over time. We know how quickly people lose. And you lose about, uh, on average, 3.4 points on a 30-point MOCA or, MS or a MMSE scale. Um, and our people actually gained points instead of losing them. So that, uh, so, so uh, you know, at least we understand that, yes, this, this is different than the historical control. So now the next one will give us a randomized control trial. And the problem, of course, is nobody wants to be in the control group. Um, even, the doctors even point out that this is, this is, to some extent, unethical. Once you see people improve on an approach that otherwise is terminal, you know, as I, we always talk about, either you're going to help this person or they're going to die. Um, this is a terminal illness um, if you don't do something about it. So it's to some extent unethical to have a control. Nonetheless, you have to find some people for at least some period of time. So one approach is you say, okay, you can go for X number of months, but then we'll get you on the, the trial side. So you can have a crossover, that's fine. Or we'll, or we'll simply a delay as a control. And as an example, Dr. Dean Ornish has done this with cardiovascular disease very successfully over the years where he has one group starting on his protocol for cardiovascular disease at time zero, and then the other one starting at some delayed time, and that therefore everybody ultimately uh, is, is treated. So that's one way to go. So I think that it's gonna be important for all of us to get the data out there to show that this is actually working. And then ultimately, uh, yes, there, it's gonna take something to get over the hump because there's a tremendous incentive to keep selling these drugs. When you have a drug, that is a $100 billion drug. It's very hard. And I talked about this in the book, uh, you know, how difficult it is to say, okay, you know what, this isn't the right way to go. We're really going to go a different direction. Uh, so for your stockholders, you, you know, you're, you're not going to be, be doing that. I do think in the future, combining these, having precision medicine, personalized protocols with targeted drugs, that is the future. And so it's sad that we've got so much polarization now. We need to get the thesis and antithesis to come to the Hegelian synthesis 
so that we can all go forward and say, okay, this actually is now, this is 21st century medicine. This is going to give us much better results. And I do think, you know, this is the century where these complex chronic illnesses will become things of the past. Uh, you know, Alzheimer's will no longer be the scourge that it has been. And that's going to be true for everything from schizophrenia to, to frontotemporal dementia to, to macular degeneration to Lewy body disease, to, you know, on and on and on. This is the time when we will make these diseases uh, less of the scourges that they are and hopefully make it so that these are rare problems. Absolutely. And it, honestly, it's thanks to people like yourself who are changing the game and who are courageous enough to step outside of what we've been doing and focus on something completely different. And you're changing lives as a result. And it takes a lot of bravery to do something like that and continue to, you know, stay the course. And we couldn't be bigger fans of your work and what you're doing and are so thankful for it. And the fact that you're putting it into books so people can readily access it whenever they want which is amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, you know, we're all interested in the same thing, which is best outcomes. And I think we need to focus on those outcomes uh, <clears throat> rather than, you know, here's how we've always done it. Yeah. Focused on these best outcomes so that we can all evolve. You know, I think people get lost in the argument of should they do this sort of thing or not, instead of saying, well, wait, how can we continue? You know, clearly there's something there. Let's keep better. Let's keep making it better and better. I do think you know, this is just the beginning. We're going to get to the point where this will be routine. Um, it's going to be, uh, as I mentioned in the second book, you know, fixing cognition is going to be as routine as straightening teeth. Um, it's going to be a relatively easy thing to do. And I think we're all kind of figuring out uh, how best to do that. I look forward to times when, uh, when it's simpler. I know the three physicians I've been so excited to work with, Dr. Kat Toops, Dr. Ann Hathaway, and Dr. Deborah Gordon, absolutely fantastic. Uh, 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 functional medicine physicians have done great work getting great outcomes with their patients. And Kat had mentioned, you know, we really need to make this simpler. Um, we've shown that it's possible to get people to improve. We haven't shown that it's practical to get them to improve. So let's make it so that everybody can do this. It's relatively simple to do this. And then we'll really be, you know, that have taken that next big step. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to quickly mention to those who are watching that might be interested in learning more. Uh, Dr. Bredesen has a few books, three books, actually, um, The End of Alzheimer's, The End of Alzheimer's Program, and then this one right here, which is his mo most recent, which has those stories that we're talking about. We're actually doing a giveaway today. So people commenting, sharing will be entered to win one of these books, as well as a ticket to MHS 2022, because Dr. Bredesen will be speaking at our next conference, which we're thrilled to have you again. So um, thank you for coming out to Santa Barbara next year. We're looking forward, looking forward to it. To it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, Dr. Bredesen, and for honestly all the work that you're doing. It's so critically important to continue to propel this forward and honestly make Alzheimer's a rare disease, which I truly hope that one day very soon it will be. So thank yeah. you again. Yeah, thanks so much. Great to talk to you and uh, look forward to the meeting.